Officer Lena Andrews recently lost her mother. In addition, Mark Myers' mother just passed away. Please remember those members of our faculty and others who have had illness or losses in their family. Um, today's going to be a little different than we've done in the past, okay? Excuse me? It's going to be a little different than we've done in the past. There will be a couple of points of time in which the room goes completely dark, okay? Don't freak out. If you're standing up, just hang on a second, and then I'll come back, okay? Just want to give that, give that warning. Um, remember that first and foremost, this is an academic institution. I know half of the world is in Ireland to watch football this weekend. But the thing we do first and foremost is we educate people for the future. And I know some of you faculty members may be a little out of practice if you didn't teach this summer. So just to get us ready for the classroom, I hope that you will enjoy this special presentation. Uh, shout out to Kyle and the advancement team for the super cool intro video. I feel like a motivational speaker. <laughs> so like Dean Hannah said, my job is to give you some fun facts to get you academically minded to go into the school year and to hopefully get you pumped up about teaching for the fall 24 semester. So first, we're going to start with a few trivia questions. You can use your friends or make a friend, but try not to look them up on your phone, okay? So as soon as you think you know an answer, just shout it out. So our first trivia question is, what is pollination and what are pollinators? Generally, what is a pollinator? Yes, so a pollinator is any organism that takes pollen from one plant to another. So what's pollination? It's plant reproduction. Good, we're, we're good at this, good job. So bees, for instance, really important pollinators. They take pollen all over the place. All right, question two. So how many species of native bees do we have here in the US? And native means they're from here. How many you think, what's your guess? We got five, we got 400, 12, zero. So there are 20,000 different species of bee worldwide. 4,000 of those are native to the United States. That's pretty cool, huh? All right, so speaking of pollen, why do bees collect pollen? It can end up in the honey, but it's not to make the honey. Some can end up with it accidentally, but it actually does have a purpose. Can anybody guess? They do collect it intentionally. Huge protein source. Instead of chicken of the sea, chicken of the flowers, right? So pollen is actually an excellent protein source for bees. So then why do bees make honey? <laughs> Thank you, Dean Town. No, that is, that is a nice thing we can convince them to do for us, but they don't do it for us, unfortunately. Not altruistic. It's food for winter, yeah. So honey is just processed or dehydrated nectar that they turn into this nice carbohydrate substance for them to have through the winter. All right, this is the last one and it's tricky. So we have 4,000 native species of bee in the US. How many of them make honey? We got two, we got all 
of them? None of them. So the species we have here that make honey are not native to the United States. And all of those species that we do have don't make honey. So as you can guess, honeybees are this specialized group of bees um, that make honey to get through the winter. Also, when you think of those social groups like the queen and the drone and the worker, that's mostly affiliated with honeybees. A lot of our bees that we have that are natives are actually solitary. They just go through the whole process by themselves. So honeybees, when we talk about them, is mostly the European honeybee. That's what we use a lot here in hives, Aphis mellifera. Um, and while they've been here a very long time, since the 1600s, they're not native to this area. They're not originally from here. And so that honey that they pull in is usually named by humans for the plant that shows up the most in that honey because it can change the flavor and the color of the honey. So if you see orange blossom honey, it means they mostly got that nectar from orange trees. Yeah, sorry. And then tupelo honey is really special to us around here because most of it comes from the tupelo tree, which is a swamp tree really only found in Florida and Georgia. And Dean Hannah has a little special treat at your table. You actually see a little tupelo honey for you to take home. That's a very special treat. That's one of the most expensive honeys per ounce that you can get because it's so specialized. So does anybody know what's in wildflower honey? It's a hodgepodge. It means they don't know what's in it. <laughs> so a big question that science is interested in and agricultural people are interested in is why do bees go to certain plants or certain flowers to get that pollen or to get that nectar? Because it ultimately impacts the flavor and the color of our honey, right? And the reason this is important in our state is because this is a huge industry, not just the honey, but also the bee behavior. So annually, Florida makes about 17 million pounds of honey worth about $27 million. That's every year. Um, in fact, consistently, they rank top five in the U.S. for honey production. And I will give somebody $5 if they can tell me who number one is. What's the number one state for honey production? We had one really close one. Somebody said Wyoming. It's North Dakota. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise me. Nobody gets $5. Sorry. <laughs> but also the bees themselves are super important. There's some people in Florida who take their hives to different agricultural sites to enhance pollination for important crops like fruits. So important, in fact, that it can give us a $65 million boost on increased yields for our crops, which is really important. So then how do we figure out where they're going and maybe why they're going to those certain flowers? Basically, we look for that pollen in the honey samples, because remember, sometimes it ends up in that honey. The old school way of doing this is getting the grain out of the honey, putting it under a microscope, and identifying it. So this picture you see here, actually quite pretty, different types of pollen grains from different plant species. This is the old school way because it's super time intensive and really difficult to learn, and it's kind of a dying art in the field. So the new way to do this is through something called environmental DNA, which is where we take DNA left behind in the environment and try to match it up with certain species that left that behind. So all species have this kind of DNA or genetic barcode that matches them up um, based on certain sequences we're looking for. So just like a barcode in the grocery store, each species has its own little unique genetic barcode that we can look for. And so we've been doing this here with our students at FSUTC. Um, so we've had people, local beekeepers, donate honey from their hives. And this is what we worked on this last spring. So you can see our three different samples. One is actually from Zoo World. They have a hive in Zoo World. And then the other two are on private residences here. And so our students in the classroom collected that honey and then matched up those barcodes with a giant database to figure out what's in our honey samples right here in Panama City. So you ready to see what they found? see it. Okay, so this is the first sample. This is Springfield, which is on the far east side. And the pie chart that you're looking at, the different colors show you the different plant species. And the shape of the chunks of the pie show you how much of that is made up by a particular species. So a bigger chunk means that species showed up a lot in that sample. So looking at this pie chart, would you say it's pretty diverse or not so diverse? I'd say pretty diverse, right? Lots of different species, nobody's taken up too big of a chunk of the pie, right? 
fun fact, the 20% almost up there is Virginia creeper. But yeah, which is usually a, a weed or a pest plant. In fact, a lot of these we would consider weeds or pest plants. So Chinese tallow is a popcorn tree. Mexican clover tends to take over lawns. So even though we might think of this as a not so well-kept lawn or space, it's actually really good for the bees because it gives them a lot of diversity. So then let's go over to Zoo World. What do you notice about this pie chart? Yes, it's changed a little bit, right? So we've dropped the number of species we have, and now we have somebody taking up a huge chunk of the pie. In this case, that 46% is something called a foxglove. It's this pretty little wildflower. But also in this sample, we have things like decorative aquatic plants. Um, we also have more of that Mexican clover. Also, my personal favorite is crepe myrtle. If you've ever been around Zoo World, you know they have a lot of urban landscaping, so the bees appreciate that too. Um, and somebody must have had a garden nearby, because there's a lot of cucumber and melon that showed up in the sample too. All right, what about the last one? Yeah, not, not quite as good, right? We have fewer species, and now almost 80% is taken up by maple trees. Other representatives would be viburnum. That's like a decorative plant. You can go buy at Lowe's for landscaping. Roses, brambles, olives, palms. When we saw this one the first time, I said this one's in a HOA, <laughs> right? Um, because bees can forage up to five miles. So if this is all that's in the sample, that means that's a pretty consistent landscape, really within a pretty decent distance of that high. So even just across those three little samples right here in Panama City, we can see a lot of differences in where the hives are going and ultimately how that honey is going to end up. So this has generated some really interesting questions from the students that we're going to try to work on this semester. So we've got more samples coming from different parts of Bay County and even surrounding counties to do those comparisons. Um, the students really wanted to do a color and taste analysis to figure out if the profile of the honey matches up with its diversity or not. Um, the beekeepers that we've talked to are actually interested in wanting to compare the floral composition nearby with what's actually ending up in the honey to see if they can plant different things to help out with the diversity. And then the big goal is fall of next year, we want to partner with someone at UF to actually teach a joint class where we compare honey, not just within our own county, but a across the state. And so hopefully I've left you with some really fun bee and honey facts, but also motivated you um, with some of the really cool stuff we can do here with our students right here at FSUC. Thanks for listening. so much, Dr. Whopper Mayors. If, if I would had a biology instructor that explained it like that, I would have made better than a C minus. Um, Dr. Clark, would you join us? Thank you very, very much, Dean Hanna. Not only is this a time to welcome back all faculty and staff and new people to the FSU family, but it's also the time that we launch our annual United Way campaign. And I can tell you all kind of great stuff about Gina, uh, but, more <laughs> but mostly I want to say that she is a servant leader, and there's many, many times I have had to call upon her. When I've heard your voices say with a student, whether it was food insecurity, whether well, it was a light bill that needed to be paid. She, the United Way has been this resource for this institution, not only to help our students, but also our faculty and staff. I remind you of Hurricane Michael. I remind you about COVID. And some folks struggled just a little bit more. And even though those were significant events for this country, for this world, it's those quiet times when we just think everything has been normalized. And that's where the United Way has so been so critically important for this institution. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, a servant leader, my friend, Gina Littleton.
for those two little kids. Those belong to me. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for allowing me this time to come and speak. It is always an honor to be at this event every year, and I appreciate the time that you guys give us to speak. Uh, we are so grateful for the opportunity to talk about United Way, our partnership with FSU Panama City, why your support is so integral to our mission, and more importantly, why your support is so important for your mission. I know most of you know who United Way is, or I hope so, because that means Dr. Clark and I are not doing our jobs well. But for those that don't, United Way of Northwest Florida covers six counties in Circuit 14, Bay, Calhoun, Gulf, Holmes, Jackson, and Washington, and have an over 90-year history in Northwest Florida as a collaborator, convener, fundraiser, and resource center for the over 50 nonprofit organizations that partner with us across those six counties. Beyond that fundamental responsibility, United Way implements its own programs and direct services in the area of health, education, and financial stability. 211, the resource line for individuals and families in need of assistance, is a United Way program and is your first line of defense when you have a student, friend, or family in need of resources. VITA, our Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, provides free tax assistance and tax prep help to our low to moderate income families. And through VITA, we were able to return $3.5 million to Northwest Florida taxpayers this year. Reading Pals, our early literacy mentor mentee program for pre K and K students, where we partner in Bay and Washington District Schools, is yet another United Way program. There are a litany of other programs and community events that we spearhead, including the sports equipment swap meet to remove the barrier of costly sports equipment from kids who would otherwise be unable to play. Stuff the Bus, our partnership with Walmart, all six of our school districts and our communities to raise school supplies for teachers and schools to provide students. Yoga and health education for seniors with the Councils on Aging in Bay and Washington counties and a list of others I won't take your time by naming, but it is extensive. United Way takes our responsibility as the central nonprofit organization very seriously. It is quite literally our mission to foster and unite resources with those in need. In fact, just two weeks ago, we submitted a $20 million grant application to the EPA to provide fresh infrastructure in the form of new pipes and clean drinking water and the upgrades and funds needed to make 80 Harris a resiliency center, including workforce development and resources all for the Glenwood neighborhood. A week before that, we were awarded $10,000 to promote and educate our communities on FAFSA. Guess who I called first? We are proud to say that we are currently partnered with FSU Panama City, Gulf Coast State College, Bay District Schools and TRIO to fund resources and events to help students prepare for their FAFSA application so that more students have the ability to attend college without the barrier of financial instability. The FAFSA grant is a prime example of just one of the programs and events that we are doing right this minute specifically for and with FSUPC. These types of collaborations are exactly what United Way should be doing. And I'm proud to say it is exactly what your United Way is doing. These partnerships are a huge win for our communities and we have every intention of continuing to find new and innovative ways to create impact through partnerships because that is the foundation of a United Way. So why do I tell you all that? Mostly because I think it's important that you know that with every program we have, every grant we are able to be awarded, we create real and lasting change in our communities and become a stronger, more sustainable organization. But also because I need your help. Our biggest assets are our partnerships and our ability to harness those partnerships to source resources for our nonprofit community. Being able to multiply incremental donations on a large scale is the simplest way to make a big impact in small doses. By donating the cost of a cup of coffee or a candy bar out of your paycheck every pay period, you can make a collectively sizable gift to us or any 501c3 registered nonprofit organization anywhere. Your gift multiplies by every other gift in this room, by every other gift in this community, times six counties collaboratively with the employees at over 120 other businesses to add up to truly impactful dollars for Northwest Florida. Your support of United Way is support of FSU Panama City. 
is the support of your community. And it is because of you that we can all, united, continue to positively impact our most vulnerable. Every dollar makes a difference. You make a difference. Each year, I stand up here and tell you what we do and why it's important. And this year, I'll add again that I need your help. Join us. Participate in our workplace campaign this year. If you think a dollar a paycheck won't make a difference, I'm here to tell you that it will, and it does. Every dollar makes a difference. You make a difference. Help us help our community. Thank you so much for your time. We are grateful for our partnership with FSU. Thank you so much, and all of you will um, be receiving in the in the email, in email information about how you can give to United Way. There are some exciting things that are happening here that are not in the classroom, that are not in the corridors. First, we have new operators of the Sandy Spear. I want to tell you something. If you just listen to this, you can go into the Sandy Spear and buy a big old bucket full after they open the next week. Buy a big old bucket full of French fries for $10. But then you bring that bucket back and it's only $5. You can take your whole department there and put down $20 and get three buckets worth of french fries. Yeah, there's a french fry lover over there. So join me in welcoming Josh Herod and Anastasia DeBizio, the new owners of the Sandy Spear. Welcome. said about the fries, they're fresh cut. We cut them here, they taste really good. Um, we're gonna wanna tra uh, transform it into like a lounge, kind of like add some couches in there, still hang out, get some food. Um, we're gonna hang out a lot, come by, study, chill. Yeah, but we look forward to seeing everyone come. Tell everyone about us. We're a little small team we're aiming for as we open. Sounds good. Uh, at the end of last year, we brought Sola Coffee uh, to the campus, and they will be coming back in the fall. I do not believe anyone is here from Sola. If they are, let me know. I urge you to support them with both Sandy Spear and Solo. It is important that we support them as it is to support our next folks. We have a bookstore here on campus and it's under new management. Anna Woods, who is the regional manager for Follett over all of the FSU locations is here together with Tiffany Poston. I welcome you to the stage to say, say a little bit and about what everybody has on their plate. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, my name is Anna Woods and I have Tiffany with me today. Uh, we just wanted to say welcome to campus and uh, just looking through the face, uh, in you know, who to contact when you have any, any problems. So uh, on the screen, you have our contact information. Uh, I am located in Tallahassee.
Nancy. Uh, Tiffany will be here. Luckily, so you can step by and say hello to her anytime you wish. Uh, I have also on the screen Samash Farham. He's our textbook manager. Uh, he'll be able to support you via email upon, on form if you have any questions and concerns about uh, ordering textbooks. Um, we did uh, work with Dr. Hanna and Dan Nick on extending our hours this fall, so we want to make sure you uh, you have plenty of time during the day to come and, and see us and shop. Um, we also included a coupon for uh, for any merchandise you would like to wish to uh, order on our website or in the store. Uh, we'll be working with our uh, general merchandise market leaders to bring some fresh merchandise to the store uh, to share with you so you don't have to travel all the way to Tallahassee. Um, so thank you for having us today. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be around in the store. Uh, you're welcome to stop by. Okay, so everybody fills out the... Yes, yes. So we have a uh, lot of uh, pieces of paper uh, for enter to win uh, four different gift bags. Uh, so please put your name in the bucket. We have a couple buckets here. I will walk around uh, the room to collect them. And we will draw the name at the end of the day. Uh, they'll be ready for pickup in the store anytime we open. Thank you, okay, guys. Thank you. So fill out that little, little uh, piece of paper there. We'll collect them. And then after the event is over, you'll be notified yep. if you want them. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. FSU has been um, undertaking a new marketing effort, and you're beginning to see changes around both the Tallahassee campus and the Panama City campus. Here, here we'll learn more about that marketing campaign. everyone. Thank you so much to Dean Hanna and team for having us here. Today I want to talk a little bit about some of the changes you're seeing and I really want to get down to why we're making these changes because I think it's important for everyone to understand and I have a few things that are super exciting to share with you as well. So I'm going to go fast through the why but here I'll be here um, afterwards if you have questions. So this is what we thought our academic identity was, but we um, did an audit over the last 16 months of all the logos that we had across campus. And there are 1,787 logos in use right now that we found. They're always emerging every day, so I'm sure there are more. Why does this matter? So when we looked at our peer institutions, most have their brand locked down. So you see on campuses like University of Florida, 18 total logos in use across campus. And this matters for a couple of reasons. One is because we want to make sure we're getting credit for the FSU is getting credit for the incredible work that's being done. I'll give one example that didn't sit great with me when I heard this. When we were recruiting for a new director for the Mag Lab in Tallahassee, our Florida's only national lab, the recruitment firm said of the magnet scientists they called around the world, every single one of them knew the mag lab. Only about half of them knew the mag lab was connected to FSU. And that's a problem because we're doing amazing, incredible work there that's not coming back to FSU. It's just kind of credited to mag lab overall. Obviously that's a partnership and there are things we need to do to clear how we brand it with the National Science Foundation. But when you look at national labs elsewhere, even the mag lab at Los Alamos or at UF, they're branding it with their logo. And so we started to really look at that being a point of concern that there are things happening with honeybees, there are things happening with the Ascent program, there are things happening across this campus and across Tallahassee and around the world that people aren't associating with FSU. They know the programs, 
they may not be connecting it directly to the university. The other piece of this is that there's a risk here from a legal perspective. So we have 23 trademarked logos across campus. We're bringing that up. We've now trademarked, uh, we're in the process of trademarking about 45 total, so adding to that 23. And why does this matter that we're allowing these other um, logos all across campus? Part of it is because we see that they were pulling some elements out of our trademarked logos for other things. And this matters because if someone were to challenge us in when we go to re-register our trademark in the court of law about these trademarks, so to say that we're pulling the three torches out of the seal and using that, and by the way, I am very guilty of this. When I applied for this job, I yanked those torches right out of the seal and put it all over my, my portfolio materials for them. Don't do that because it's hurting us. Um, if someone were to challenge our ability to keep the seal, this could ultimately hurt our ability to show we have control of our brand. So we just want to make sure we're protected in this way. And so we did a risk assessment with Oliver Ruiz, an FSU grad who's a partner at Malloy & Malloy in Miami, a really fantastic trademark lawyer. And he said, I think you're, you have a significant risk. Um, we should really look at how we're using logos across campus and what we're doing and to add to those trademarks if it makes sense. When we looked at our peer institutions in the US News and World Report, out of the top 100, all three of them have three primary identifying marks. An athletic, a primary athletic logo, for us that would be the Seminole head. The, they have a seal, which is usually held sacred. So it's on your diploma, it's on commencement materials, it's on your official transcripts. And then they have something that just says their name that you can recognize within seconds. And that was the piece that we were missing. This delightful gentleman here is uh, Bob Brown. He came to do cons some consulting with the president's cabinet. And in that discussion, um, he shared his experiences as the former president for Boston University. They went through a pretty significant rebrand where they were BU for a really, really long time. And they moved to Boston as their primary identifier. And the goal of that was that rebrand was focused on two things. It was focused on helping them get into the AAU and helping them increase in uh, US News and World Report by adding to um, their reputation as by using Boston in the technology hub that it is. So just some of the numbers I wanted to share, and I'm gonna, I'll walk through a little bit more about this. So here's an example of where we've struggled. When we're using the seal as the primary identifier, if you look at this slide, we actually won the People's Choice Award in the ACC and Venture, and this is so cool. They used automotive technology to help regulate um, a respirator for COVID patients, and it was, it's really incredible work we did in conjunction with Mayo Clinic. But when I'm looking at this group, I would not associate them with FSU. I would think they were, at least the first two were from UNC. But, and then also, if you don't know that's our seal, you don't know that's our seal. It's hard to read. You have to kind of squint and see it. And they all also have seal pins on, but you can't, you can't see that. And so this is one of the kind of an easy picture to ex explain why we wanted to add that third mark that says FSU. The other thing that we've seen is that in quick tests, we've done, and we do not have a significant sample size on this in, for full transparency, we're still researching this. But we saw that our seal is being emulated by a lot of for-profit universities. And at first glance, people who aren't from Florida are confusing the FSU seal with the for-profit. We don't think that they necessarily have anything wrong with them. They are educational institutions, but they're not our ones. They're not research one institutions. And that's what we wanna be affiliated with. And then we did a survey and looked at the logos and the logo progress of all AAU institutions. As you know, and if we've said publicly a lot of times, um, this is one of the president's goals, is to get gain admittance into the American, I always get this wrong, American Association of Universities, thank you. Um, I always flip them, so I always say Association of American Universities, sorry for that. Uh, so we looked at how quickly recognizable these are, and when you look at the public universities on here, they all, for the most part, are immediately recognizable with their name. We also benchmark with Clemson, Tennessee, University of Michigan, and spent some time with them looking at their rebrands and learning from what they said they did wrong. So they were very forthcoming with us about what worked and what didn't.
So this is why it matters. I could talk to you about this trademark law accessibility literally all day. So if you ever just want me to come to Panama City and have a one-on-one -on -one lunch with you and we can talk about that, I will geek out with you. I know you guys did not want to hear that. So I'm going to skip through this real quick and we're going to move on to the fun stuff. So this is a brand overview of what we're, um, where you can get all of our assets is brand.fsu.edu. This is the updated institutional identity. Now, some of you may say this isn't updated. We've had this since 2014. Um, and some of you also may say, oh gosh, this feels very athletic. How many of you immediately thought this is super athletic? Okay, like a few, that's, that's fewer than I thought. Um, that was a lot, I, we actually started not here. This is not where I wanted to land. I wanted to create something separate. But in spending time with Virginia and Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech had recently gone through something very similar where they tried to create a separate academic identity. USF has done the same. And in both places, they failed and spent a whole lot of money in the process. So we looked at doing some research. We looked at um, AAU postdocs around the country and we asked them to look at this logo and give us words that they associated with it. Except for a person from University of Florida who knows us well, everybody else said strong, bold, and one word that was surprising to me was tribal. I have no idea why this is tribal to them, but none of them said athletic except for that person from University of Florida. And these are the faculty that we will, we will want to continue to recruit, the faculty we want to partner with for grant applications, and the people that will ultimately probably become our rankers with US News and World Report in that 20% reputation uh, score. 20% of our score is based on reputation of other provost presidents and enrollment leaders. And again, not where we started, but it made sense and it's immediately recognizable. Post-COVID, the research shows that we want people to recognize what something is associated with within three seconds. That's down from seven seconds before COVID. Um, our attention span's growing even shorter. There's a lot of research on this. This is something that you can see and you immediately affiliate with FSU. So I'm not gonna bore you with too much detail here, just the things that matter the most to you. So we split this into six levels. There are many different places um, where your organization your organizations, your college, your department, your division, your SGC fit. And so I'm gonna do this as quickly as I can, but there's tons of information available to you on brand.fsu.edu. So this is our primary institution ide uh, institutional identity. This is what we should be using on facility shirts, on maps, on grant applications, agendas, table cards, on most things should be FSU, like this. The seal moves to a restricted use trademark. So we're not getting rid of the seal, we're just protecting it more. And I'm gonna share one thing. So I grew up kind of in the sticks in central Florida. And for me, moving to Tallahassee um, when I came to FSU in 2001 was a pretty big move. It was far away from my parents. It was, there was a lot. And I'm so proud of the education I received at FSU. In a lot of ways, I went on to work for a lot of global companies and as a kid who had not traveled internationally or even traveled out of the state, had not flown on an airplane until I was 18 years old, for me, FSU gave me the confidence to feel like I could go work for global companies and I could do things. I'm so proud that, I'm, that I have an education from FSU. And so my first week on campus in this role, we moved from Boston, I'm thrilled to be there, I borrow the president's golf cart and I drive around FSU Tallahassee and I see 26 trash cans with the seal that adorns my diploma around campus, trash cans. And to me, that just created some cognitive dissonance. I was struggling with the value of my education if it's also on a trash can. A lot of places have seals that are sacred. You don't walk over the seal, or you walk over the seal after you graduate, or there's lore around not being able to graduate. And we just wanna protect it because we're using it for a lot of and this is less so in Panama City. I would say, y'all are doing a great job. We copied you on a lot of things. I'm gonna show you some of the things that were fully influenced by PC. Um, but we wanna protect this. So highest level honors and awards, commencement, diplomas, continuing education, professional development, those types of things, use for the president, the provost, not office of the president, registrar, library books, things like that, but not putting it on trash cans, not putting it on the ground, um, so 
we keep it sacred. Athletic marks are still, they haven't really changed. The only thing that's added here that we want to be careful of how we use is the color turquoise. So we have a relationship with Nike, um, and this is not true for your eSports program. I saw Katie earlier. Katie, you are good with your uniforms. Um, but the tur color turquoise that we use specifically for the N7 agreement with Nike, actually things purchased that are that color should be sending money to the Native American Indigenous Studies Center as well. And we want to be really protective of that. So we have created a separate turquoise that was inspired by what Panama City is doing that you can use however you'd like. We're just going to avoid that specific color. So you've seen these, I think many of you have. You can see them, you guys have done such a good job. But on the table cards, we have provided for you specific things here for Panama City. So we have FSU, underwater crime scene investigation um, program, and then FSU Panama City underneath it. There's a lot coming. We c if you need anything that we didn't already create, ask for it. There's a form on the website. It's It takes 60 seconds. We will create it for you and make sure you have it. But Dean Hanna and Becky have done a really phenomenal job of making sure that we did have a lot in there for Panama City. We want you to use those. Same thing with taglines. Please use your taglines. We want you to continue to use those. Just don't put them right underneath your lockup so it doesn't look like it's the same thing. Just create a little separation. Some things require separate branding. And this is kind of a step further than most universities at our level are doing. Panama City Knoll Fest will always get its own logo. That's incredibly important that you are able to do something creative there. Welcome week, orientation, those types of things will have their own logos. Um, we also have a few others. There, if you have things that are not on here that should be, there's a quick form. It takes 90 seconds. And I review those with the provost every two weeks, and we'll make sure they're added. Other things that show up here are very specific. So FSU Panama City Ascent, that logo predates all of this, and it's related to the, I believe, the Triumph Gulf Coast grant. Um, okay, so that is important that we keep it just like this, and it doesn't change. It does say Florida State University, so thank you, Ascent, um, for doing that. Inspire, as we build that program here with the additional Triumph Gulf Coast grant around aerospace, that will keep its own um, own logo as well. And then sub-branding that doesn't require additional FSU brand is the eSports program. That predates the one in Tallahassee, and we wanted to make sure we were protecting the, um, the program as a different group. So if you have more things here, we will look at those. We'll make sure we're doing the best to, to be the best advocates for you on all of this. Um, market safe place sub-brands are sec separate legal entities that need additional logos. These have to be trademarkable. They need to be separate legal entities, and there's work here. Most things aren't a marketplace sub-brand, so you probably won't have many things in this category. RSOs, the rules didn't change at all for your registered, recognized student organizations. We're just enforcing them a little bit more. So if you say FSU Surf, we want you to just flip it to say Surf Club at FSU. That's already the rule that's been in place since 2001, I'm sorry, 2021. Um, so we're, we're coming back. I haven't seen anything come through Null Central that concerns me out of Panama City. So does this mean we're taking away your ability to make cool things? Absolutely not. Kyle would never let me get away with that. So you can still be creative. You can still do beautiful things. We just want you to use your lockup so we can make sure that it's affiliated with FSU. And then co-branding, people have asked for very specific guidelines on co-branding. These are available on the website. I'm not going to go through them, but it tells you how to list these so it doesn't get messy. So this is the fun stuff that I really wanted to spend a few minutes on. Um, these FSUs, we've bought a lot of them. They, uh, many of them will be coming to Panama City for whatever you would like. Um, we're going to go through color. My, my team came with me so we could measure some of your seals and, and buy you some replacements with new additional branding. Um, these are the colors. Westcott Water is fully inspired by Panama City. This is a color your admissions and your SGC was already using. We also added a Gulf Sands, a, um, in, inspired by your beautiful view. Um, and then these are additional colors we've added that are fully approved. You can use as accent colors because there's a lot you can do with garnet and gold and black and white, but you need some, some flavor in there sometimes, especially from a data visualization perspective. Oh, I don't, I, 
have I been laser pointing you in the eye the entire time? It is fully laser pointed. I didn't know. We still want you. I'm so sorry if I have done that. I was wondering why you were crying. Are you okay? Oh, gosh. I made him cry with the laser. I'm so sorry, Commander. So color usage tips, we just want you to use mostly garnet and gold, but you can play with these accent colors. These certainly aren't the only colors you can use. We just wanted to give people freedom. This is what it can look like with data visualization as well, so it does help. I have the great pleasure of sitting through the Board of Trustees meetings with the President, and he sometimes has, I don't know, between 84 and 6,000 slides with charts. And after you have different shades of garnet, it starts to be real confusing. So we wanted to help him with data visualization as well. Um, fun things that I think you might be excited about. These should automatically be updated on your phone within the next month if you have an FSU app downloaded. If you open up your text messages and there's that sticker option there, we've created special stickers just for FSU. If you have any that you would like for Panama City that are specific, we will create them. We made these in house. We can turn these in about two days. So let us know what you want. We'll get you some special sticker. We, us old folks call them emo emojis, but um, they're stickers is what I, my team has, has told me. We've also done hand-drawn icons. Um, these are also quick turn. Amanda Cole on my team drew these. There's, there's like 1,600 more. Um, if you have specific icons you want for presentations that you could, go, like we might need a B. I feel like we need a B. We'll get you a B. So there's a place to request these. We want to make sure you're getting what you need. Um, just one thing about the Seminole Tribe, and my dear friend and Dr. Andrew Frank will talk to you about this next, but we, the only thing we've, that's changed with how to handle our relationship with the Seminole Tribe of Florida on my side that we're asking people to really be thoughtful about is using puns with the word knoll. So a question I got was, what other ethnicity can you make cutesy puns out of their name and it's okay? And I thought that was astute, and I thought that was interesting. And so we've gone through, we don't have a hard, fast date on this. We know that people are very emotional about it. But things on, on, in Tallahassee like Cheminoles, which is the chemistry department's name, we're working with them to change it so it's not, I think in some ways we think we're honoring people by doing this, but it's, it can come across a different way. And so we want to just be mindful of this. So if you have something like that and you need help in branding, coming up with names, we're happy to help you. I'm sure Kyle would be happy to help you as well. Um, but that's one thing, the only thing that we would like people to change. I see my SGC friends smiling. We'll talk afterwards. <laughs> we'll chat. Um, reminder, the brand website is brand.fsu.edu. We have a brand folder, which ha it's linked on the brand website. You don't need to write this down, where you can download all the lockups, all the logos, beautiful pictures. We came and took some specific pictures in Panama City, so your stuff's there too. Um, we'll continue to add that um, and update those quarterly. And then um, we have a bunch of assets you can borrow. Since you do have someone that comes to Tallahassee so often, you are able to check these out from us free of charge if you would like to use them. Um, we're also providing Panama City specific things. So you've seen a few step and repeats out here that the team produced um, and brought with us, but we will get these to you and there will be a checkout system here to make sure that you can be represented well. Last two things, and I know I'm at time, pa way past time probably, um, we have Canva. Um, we are purchasing that centrally for everyone. So if you're designing simple things, slides, flyers, um, all kinds of things, we will, that will be there. And it's not like your normal Canva, it's Canva Enterprise. So Canva is working us, with us on FSU templates. And then last thing, I'm not even gonna go to this video, but I may not be able to skip it. Um, this is the institutional ad. Literally no one has seen this yet, so this will show for the first time in, during the Ireland game, and I'm gonna play it. I think, I'm, I think they're playing my music to get off the stage, but I am gonna play it real quick for you. Kyle, could you push play for me?
bags. They've come in, and we brought them in little bags for you. Please get those. Um, they're upstairs. I think Summer has distributed most of them already. If you haven't ordered them, we are paying for those through September 1st. So please let us pay for your stuff. Please let me, the budget that I went and asked for and fought for, let me buy you a name tag if you want it or a business card. The instructions have been sent out to your department heads. We just want to make sure you get those. We have desk calendars. We have lapel pins. There's fun stuff coming, but you have to order a name tag and a business card. So please let me help. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. I want to um, emphasize what she just said. Work with Summer, work with Becky, work with Dorothy. Order the name cards, the name tags by September 1st. Primary reason, she's paying for it. <laughs> that is it. That is the primary reason. So department heads get with Summer about doing that. You heard a lot of information about the relationship with the Seminole Indians. We're going to now have a discussion about that relationship. All right, so thank you all for your time. I'm going to do my best to, um, I don't know, speak straight. Um, I grew up in South Florida. I went to Seminole Middle School of all places. My father worked in Hollywood, Florida, which is where he was within the shadow of the Seminole tribe where their tribal headquarters are. Um, I went to University of Florida for grad school. I studied the Native South, and it wasn't until maybe my second to last year there that I actually came to realize um, Seminoles are a modern people, not an ancient people. Um, that doesn't mean they don't have ancient roots. It doesn't mean that, like, as a historian, I care a lot about the 16th century. Sometimes I care about the 12th century. But the 21st century is what I want to talk to you about today. Um, so, like, we all know the name Osceola. Like that is probably the most recognizable name for the Seminole tribe nationwide. Um, and we all may have images of who Osceola is, but my guess is the image that comes to your mind is not the image that was on Susanna's PowerPoint, which was the chairman of the tribe today wearing the beautiful turquoise patchwork jacket. Um, his last name is Osceola, the most common last name in the Seminole tribe today. So. Right, but our, our ideas of who Seminoles are always takes us to like 1830, Andrew Jackson, war with the United States, right? And as a historian, that brings like joy to my heart. As, as horrible as that history is, I want people to care about the past, but as members of an FSU community, I want us thinking really carefully about the present. Um, and like the image that you have here on the screen uh, with our president and Kyle Doney, um, who's a tribal member and a member of our board and also an alum, is probably a more important image um, than even the images of the lovely introduction for me of Seminoles in the, in, the, in the Everglades and elsewhere, say in the 1940s. So the relationship between FSU and the Seminole tribe of Florida is a complicated one. Um, and like I've had an individual relationship with tribal members for 20 some odd years. I've been at FSU for 17, but before that I was at FAU, and before that I was in California, but I was doing research with them, right? So I've had this like relationship with them, but I also have friends from like, who were born in Havana. I don't have a relationship with Cuba, right? I have friends for, born all over the earth, and I can say I have a friend from Italy, but I don't have a relationship with Italy, right? But like, I hope you can understand that part of it. FSU and the Seminole tribe have a relationship 
as institutions with one another. As the director of a center of Native American and Indigenous Studies, I have a relationship with like my counterparts with a federally recognized tribe. And I think of it as a partnership or a friendship. We work in collaboration and consultation with one another. But the, probably the most important word, and I don't, I'm going to use it, but it's probably not the best word. I think of it as like friendship. Like we're not friends in that sometimes there are tribal members who I don't know. But as an institution who is a partner with someone, but not like a partner where it's written down. When you have a friendship with someone, you think before you act. When you have a friendship with someone, sometimes you do the right thing, even though they don't, and you like, you hope they don't have to tell you to do the right thing. You don't look for permission to do things. I know I shouldn't, but maybe if they give me permission, I'm going to do it. And the prevailing wisdom at FSU and other institutions that have relationship with tribes is often in 2000, whatever, the tribe signed off on it and gave us permission, and therefore we have carte blanche to do whatever we darn well please. And that's not the relationship that sustains us. There's a long tradition in Native American communities, not just Seminole, but all Native American communities, where friendships and relationships have to be constantly renewed. Uh, right, it, it almost makes sense in like a non-Native context. You have a friend and you haven't seen them for a while, and at some point, they were your friend. Right, if you have, have a, a, a friendship of trust, trust has to be renewed constantly. And if friendships go away, sometimes you can contact again, and it feels like old times, but you're not going to be as quick to share that which like, you otherwise would. So here is, like, the, so when we think about reciprocity, that, that's kind of a way to think about it. So here's a picture. It's only from maybe a month ago, sometime in early August. So maybe not even that long ago. Maybe it was July. This is all the 18-year-olds who graduated from high school from the Seminole tribe. Um, they're all offered a trip where the chairman of the tribe brings them somewhere to talk about the rights and responsibilities of being a tribal member. What does it mean to have tribal health care? How do you get housing? How do you vote? How do you register? There's all sorts of things that when you come to an adult as a member of the Seminole tribe you have to do, and they can go wherever they want. And FSU and our president and our, our, our kind of administrators provide a, a place for them to do that. And now this is the second year they're doing it, and we hope they come back. Right? This is like it's not a one and done. This is kind of a part of a relationship, but it's on their choosing to come to us. Um, and it's them coming to us, which I think is probably the most important part for us to think about. So, really quickly, the Seminole tribe has six reservations. Most of their citizens, or about 4,800 of them, live on those reservations. They don't need to live on a reservation, but it, there are certain services that they can provide for themselves there. To be a reservation means that it is owned by the tribe. But the pink slip, if you will, the deed for the tribe is in a lockbox with the federal government. It can't be mortgaged, it can't be deeded, it can't be sold. Um, it is permanently theirs, and they have not just use rights of it, they have legal sovereignty over that land. Um, so if you are on the Big Cypress Reservation, which is the largest of the Seminole reservations, you are standing on tribal land, you're standing on the land of the state of Florida, and you're standing on land of the United States. And so if you are there, you are following the laws of all three, much the same way that here, we're in Florida and we're in the United States. So you, you can throw county on that as well. Um, the Seminole tribe of Florida is the Seminole tribe, not the Seminole nation, right? If we're gonna be, use the name of Seminole, we should know some basic things. If you have a tribal member on campus, please do not call them Seminole nation. You probably don't want to be called FSU Tallahassee. You probably don't want to be called University of Florida. You probably don't want to be called England. Right? Seminole tribe is the Seminole tribe of Florida. The Seminole nation was the Seminole nation of Oklahoma. In 1800, they were the same people, and they lived basically right here to Jacksonville, across the panhandle of North Florida. Um, and then a little thing called colonialism happened. Warfare with the United States forced removal, a population of somewhere between 16 and 18,000 individuals living in North Florida. But 80 years of warfare leaves roughly 300 Seminoles living in Florida, maybe 4,000 living in what becomes Oklahoma. The rest slaughtered 
or died of old age but was never able to have children to re- re- kind of recreate that population. So it is a horrible story. So when Seminoles talk about themselves as seeing Florida as their homelands or they see themselves as unconquered, it's that story that they're talking about. They're not talking about football. They're not talking about being in a classroom. They're talking about once upon a time, the Seminoles of Florida were in the, what, 15 to 30 or 20,000, depending on how you count how in North Florida, some in South Georgia. And then they're down to 300, and they've grown up to now almost 5,000. Uh, but this is a, a remarkably kind of tragic story of, of, of resilience, if you will. All right, so today they are sovereign. Not only is their land sovereign, but the Seminole tribe of Florida, along with 500 plus other tribes in the United States, they have what's called nation to nation status with the United States. So they are sovereign. You live under, like we all have state law and federal law. They also have tribal law. And when tribal law conflicts with state law or conflicts with federal law, the U.S. Supreme Court or the federal court system decides what does the U.S. Constitution say about this? So like, it's not that they're free of American law. Tribal citizens pay U.S. taxes. They have to live by all the laws, but they also have to live by the laws of themselves. But they have self-governance. They can build roads on their reservation where they see fit. They can run their own housing or health care or schools. They have a charter school at one. They have a private school right off on another. And they have a Bureau of Indian Education school that they run. So they have self-governance and make decisions for themselves. And for our purpose, the most important decision they make is that they get to decide for us whether we get to be Seminoles or not. That is a choice of theirs. We can walk away. If ever one day Susanna says, oh, we're done. See, ah, see how I did that. Right? If, 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 so, if the president, if ever, if ever that were to come to be, right, that is our right. And if the Seminoles ever wanted to say, we don't want this anymore, that is their right. That is the operational like, relationship that we have. We are FSU Seminoles because the tribe says we are. They are the one giving us the honor. They are the one giving us the gifts, if you will. Um, and out of that relationship comes obligations for us. If there are obligations in being a Seminole tribal member, there are obligations for us to use their name, to use their likeness, means that we have to reciprocate something in return. We're not giving them something by being FSU. They are giving us by being the Seminoles. So the first thing that they have told us that they want is they want us to know stuff about them. They want us to use the present tense when referring to the Seminole tribe. Rather than the Seminoles were a proud people or some generic kind of pap like that, they want people to talk about them in the present. They want us to know something about their culture. So when you see the clothing that they wear, there's the Seminole tribe on your, on your left, kind of right behind me. The brightly colored clothing that they often wear, kind of their traditional clothes, it's called patchwork. It's an easy word to have, right? Lots of people do patchwork. The, the homes, on, there, this is one that's at FSU, but if you go into South Florida and sometimes in North Florida, there are thatched roofs, no walls. These are their traditional homes. They're called chiquis. Um, these are simple things that we can learn. They're families they call clans. They trace them through their, their mother. And to have a clan is kind of the building block of their community. Um, simple things that we should learn, just like we learn things about friends of ours from different cultures, we know, like, we know the dietary restrictions of lots of our friends when they come out of faith. We know all sorts of things about our friends of different backgrounds. We should start learning more about who they are. So I'm going to do a little something, because I know Susanna already talked a little bit about this turquoise and how we can use it. But I want to talk about this picture. This is Chairman Osceola, the most proud alumni I have ever met from the University of Miami. And this was at homecoming last year. My wife grew up in Miami, and her father went to UM, and she grew up going to UM football games. So they were chatting like UM football in the president's box at the Duke game. And I approached the chairman, reintroduced myself, and we had this conversation, me as an UF PhD, 
and him as a UM alum talking about what does it mean to have football allegiance to somewhere else but loves the university. That those are two separate things. Who you care for to score a, a, a whatever doesn't matter. Like someone kicks a field goal, great. The relationship between the tribe and the university is not about that. It can build off of it, but it's not that. What the tribe wants from FSU is to be treated as a modern, very modern nation with interests of their own, with diverse interests. They're interested in our engineering programs. They're interested in our biological pro programs. They may be interested in bees. They live in a world surrounded by sugar. And as the Everglazer being reclaimed, if you will, and, and, and allowed to flow again, there is an infinite number of questions that requires a tremendous amount of expertise that they need to figure out before they are flooded out. And so our colleges of engineering are work with, working with them to try to figure out how they can navigate this world. Their schools have all sorts of questions, and we have world-class colleges of education that we can draw upon. And we can start like, taking and massing what it is that we do as a 21st century institution of higher learning, the best researchers from around the country, around the globe, and how do we pair that to help the Seminoles ask questions of their own? And that's kind of how we want to start thinking about what we're doing. And in exchange, the tribe helps us proactively create traditions that they are comfortable with. So I'll go back to myself. When I first saw Osceola on a horse, white guy, either a polo player or a rodeo star, wearing red face, wearing a costume, feather in the hair, with a flaming spear. Like, I, I don't have to like fill in the blanks for where like lots of people who don't quite understand or your first impression may be what my first impression was. I shook my head I'm like, I just can't believe this is what we're doing. I've had friends say to me, what year is it? And then I've had seminal friends remind me that their aunt is the one who designed the clothing. That elder women not only do it, they do it as volunteers. That the photo on the other side is an Osceola down at Brighton Field Day. Every year the Brighton Reservation has basically a multi-day event that's rodeo meets powwow. Um, our band goes down there on invitation and plays. And when I was there, Osceola, our Osceola was there taking photos with tribal members and the line was two and a half hours long. So I was uncomfortable with seeing it. They were not. And in the story of that relationship, my concerns don't matter. That says something about me. Like, and I'm allowed to be uncomfortable, and I'm allowed to not want to have my photo. I don't need to do the tomahawk chop or whatever. Like, there's all sorts of things I don't have to do. But what I can't do is speak on behalf of the tribe. The Seminole Tribe of Florida is many things, um, but shy is not one of them. Soft-spoken is not one of them. They have appeared in front of the U.S. Supreme Court in multiple cases to be leaders in trying to expand what it means to be sovereign in the United States. They have used that sovereignty to become global leaders in multiple, they are what, the seventh largest cattle herders in the United States. They are, I believe, the fourth largest real estate developers in the state of Florida. And they are leaders in gaming nationwide. They own Hard Rock International. They bought it for just close to a billion dollars in cash. At the press conference, Max Osceola, who was then on the board, said we're going to buy America back one hamburger at a time. Right? They're not shy. When FSU messes up, they tell us that we are messing up. So if you see something that is happening, we have kind of two obligations. If you're uncomfortable doing it, don't do it. If you're going to create something, you ask for permission. 
you think to yourself first, is this a good idea? And if you think it really is a good idea, then you ask. If you need help asking, ask me, I'll introduce you. I'm not the gatekeeper. It's not for me to decide what's good or bad. If you want to know if you think it's a good idea, I'll give you my opinion, but it's just my opinion. But there, there are mechanisms for us to ask the tribe, hey, do you think this is a good idea or a bad idea? And like we're learning what that means. Um, and that, that learning goes back to this idea of what a friend is. The longer you're friends with someone, the more you can kind of guess what they want to do or not want to do. But every once in a while, your friends sur sur like surprise you. All right. Very quickly, I'm going to give a plug for what it is that brings me here today, other than me knowing a lot about FSU and the tribe. Um, FSU just launched a Native American and Indigenous Studies Center. Um, and for those of you who are engaged in research or in student-oriented kind of activities, we're really doing two things. One, as a Native American Indigenous Studies Center, we're trying to find ways to basically connect us as an institution with tribes not just in Florida and not just the South, but globally, so we can find ways to work together. And that could be working together in a laboratory, working together with uh, events for students, for public education, for culture. However you can imagine what that relationship can be look, look like, we're trying to figure out ways to do that. This works out of this very basic idea that we are building and continuing to build mutual trust with the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Um, right? On a daily basis, I get a text from someone in the tribe, but someone is like one of five people. The chairman will never call me. I think we can all guess who the chairman calls if he wants someone from Florida State. My guess is he has President McCullough's cell number. I would hope. Right? The way in which these things operate. But as an institution, as a center, we're trying to find ways that we can kind of put our thumb on the scale to make Florida State the leader, not just someone who's like living up to what we should be doing, but to kind of chart a path for like institutions across the country. If you're going to partner with tribes, what should we be doing? Um, and I spent maybe the last year looking at what other schools do. And other schools do this, and then I'll end with what we do to show it as different. Other schools tell students, take one class of history, two anthropology classes, three art classes, a philosophy class, and a theater class. And then you can put yourself in your shoes, if you will, and walk in the moccasins of someone else and understand the world differently. And there is a virtue in trying to understand how other people understand things. That's very different, however, than what we're trying to do. Although as much as we're going to do a little bit of that, what we want to do is ask tribal folk, tell us, what do you need from us? How can we work together? What do you want to teach us? What do we need to know? So we become either the partner or even the MC, not the source of authority. Um, and that's kind of the direction that we're heading. So if you have anything that you want to share, if you have interest in this, please let me know. We're always looking for um, um, various partners. All right, before I end, two words for you to know. Mudo or Shonabish. Mudo is a Muscogee Creek, one of the two languages that the Seminoles speak. Shonabish is Miccosukee, the other language that the Seminoles speak, and they both mean thank you. Um, so thank you for your time.
Okay, it's going to take us just a second. Ooh, okay. So. so it's time for us to have some fun. So I want all of you to have some fun with us. Okay, y'all agree? Y'all going to help us out? Okay. Snap, clap, tap your toes. Do what you feel like. Put your hands together. We crushed it. Now it's in the past. We can make this leap through the curtains of the waterfall. So say Geronimo. 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 Can you feel? Just a boy with a broken toy, all lost and caught at the curtains of the wall. So it's here I stand as a broken man, but I found my friend at the curtains of the wall. Now I'm falling down through the crashing sound, and you come around at the curtains of the wall. And you rush to me, and it sets us free. So I fall to my knees at the curtains of the waterfall. So say Geronimo, say Geronimo, say Geronimo. Come on, sing, guys. Say Geronimo, say Geronimo, say Geronimo. Can you? Geronimo. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. stranger to the dark hide away they say cause we don't want your broken heart I tend to be ashamed of my scars run away they say no one will love you as you are but I won't let them break me down to dust I know that there's a place for us for we are glorious. When the sharpest words want to cut me down. I'm going to send a flood that will drown them out. I am brave. I am bruised. I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. Look out, because here I come. And I'm marching on to the beat I drum. This is me, oh, 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 another round of bullets hits my skin. We'll fire away, cause today I won't let the shame sink in. We are warriors. That's what we become. I won't let them break me down to dust. I know that there's a place for us. For we are glorious. When the sharpest words want to cut me down. Gonna send a flood, gonna drown them out. I am married, I am bruised. I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. Look out, because here I come. And I'm marching on to the beat I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. Oh, oh, oh. Cause here I come, and I'm marching on to the beat I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. All right, guys. We got one more for you. Thank you for the love. We thank you yeah. for the love. We really thank do. You we very appreciate much. you. This is a pretty well known song, so if you can sing along with us. Yeah, so we're not awkward up here by ourselves. When the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we see oh I won't be afraid no I won't be afraid just 
as long as you stand, stand by me. So darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me. Oh, stand. Stand by me. Stand by me. If the sky we look upon yeah, should tumble and fall, or the mountain should crumble to the sea, I won't cry, I won't cry, no, I, I won't shed a tear just as long as you stand, stand by me. So darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me. Oh, stand. Stand by me. Stand by me. Darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me, oh, stand, stand by me, stand by me. Come on, play it, Ty. Come on, round of applause. Also known as Maestro. We taught him well. Clearly what you were hearing was for an encore, so they, they will be back for one last song at the very end. Um, I had not seen the video. I had not heard them play. This started as a very quick conversation between Tyrick and Brandon by the piano one day, and Tyrick said, yeah, I play a little. <laughs> And I was standing there, and Brandon goes, do you? He goes, well, Tyra goes, do you play? He goes, no, I sing. Well, we ought to get together sometime. And I thought about it for about a week, and I said, yeah, they should. <laughs> and they should perform a welcome back. So thank you, Katie. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Brandon. And thank you, Tyra, uh, for entertaining us today. Much appreciated. <laughs> As we move toward the uh, end of our program and our special guest from Commander Mosey, I'd ask you to join me first in welcoming Creed Conrad. Creed is the president of the pseudo government here at FSU Hamlin Field.
afternoon, everyone. I am Creed Conrad, president of the student government and a junior in the mechanical engineering program. It is my honor to stand before you today as we begin a new academic year. I want to start by saying thank you. In my short two years at SSUPC, I've experienced firsthand what it means to be a student here, and I have seen how much your support matters. My journey to SSUPC wasn't straightforward. It was not until my senior year of high school that I realized I wanted to pursue engineering. Before that moment, I had, e I had not even considered college, and with limited time, I reached out for help. But I only found one person at my high school who truly guided me. This individual helped me with scholarships, classes, and SAT prep. At that time, I, ha I was determined to attend a particular university that offered a full scholarship if I scored high enough on the SAT. It was December 17th, and I was on my way home from work when a friend called me telling me the results were in. This was supposed to be my ticket. I sat in my car, opened my phone, and despite scoring well on the practice tests, I felt like I had failed when I saw my test results. I had scored 200 points lower than I had on the practice tests, 30 points lower than I needed for the scholarship. What made it worse is that I messed up the math section, which, is not, which doesn't make any sense because I scored the highest on that on all the practice tests. I chose engineering for a reason. As you can imagine, I was devastated that what I thought my path was was not possible. But then I remembered before I took the SAT, I had prayed, thy will be done. It is something I always added to my prayers because I know that I do not have the foresight that God does. And honestly, if it was up to me, I would not be in the good position that I am today. Five months later, someone told me about FSUPC. I remember when I first walked into admissions, Mia Bennett stepped out of her office to help me. From that moment on, every faculty and staff member provided me unwavering support and mentorship, unlike anything I had ever experienced before. One notable event was when Dr. Fatima mentioned the open house for the Magnetics and Materials Science Lab in Tallahassee. When she realized that me and several other students were determined to attend, she immediately jumped through hoops to ensure that we had the resources that we needed. With one, only one day's notice, several of us were on our way to Tallahassee thanks to a campus vehicle, Dr. Fatima's guidance, and Dean Hanna's financial support. While we were there, a student was even offered a job as a research assistant. These opportunities for student growth were due to people who cared. And believe it or not, I spent a lot of time talking to other students, and everyone has these same stories. When asked what makes FSUPC special, I have heard many different answers, small class sizes, proximity to the beach, volleyball club. And while these are all great parts of our campus, I believe that the true strength of FSUPC is you. Your mentorship and support are invaluable to these students. And for me, it was even an answer to prayer. It is that very strength, strength which I try to reflect through student government. I make it our goal to ensure that our students get the same kind of support that you have given us. I'm looking forward to the next few years, and I cannot wait to hear more student stories. Thank you once again for your dedication and support. Let's make this a fantastic year for our students. Now, I want everybody to understand that Krieg on the SAT that he it's a southern word if you're new here, that he messed up on. He scored a 1290 on his SAT. So at his practice test, he was scoring a 1490. He still had to meet very high standards to get into FSU. And he said, he told me that, I said, well, did you take it again? And he said, no, because I'd waited to the last chance to take the SAT because I was not planning to go to college. And we're glad that advisor in North Bay, North Bay Haven at Arnold um, led you here, led you to FSU Panama City to be part of this family. Um, when I, we talk about family, which Creed 
to mention the support that all of you give. Earlier, I mentioned uh, folks who had lost a parent or a family member. Um, we, um, I um, do not believe that I got everyone, and I would also ask you to keep Matt Chapin in your thoughts and prayers. Um, he lost his father uh, not too long ago. Um, thanks to all of you who have participated uh, today. As is our tradition, we always recognize our new faculty and staff. They were shown on the screen during lunch. If you have joined us in the last year, please stand and be recognized. You know, I always love this event. We plan for the future, have a little fun, and get ready for the academic year. But it'd be inappropriate to talk about this next year without first talking about a few things that we accomplished last year. The list is way too long for me to mention everything, but here's a few highlights. We started the 23-24 academic year with record enrollment. I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead and tell you we're going to break that record this year. Con congratulations to each of you. We took on a new venture, the Collegiate School at FSU Panama City. When President McCullough and the First Lady visited the school this past year, they came away not only impressed with the quality of education, but also with the leadership of students. Right before this event, I was at the Triumph Gulf Coast meeting and three of the students were there to talk to the board about their experience at the collegiate school. I, I was so proud of the student government president who, as she finished, she said, oh, and by the way, she was talking to leaders of industry, political leaders. She said, by the way, her name is Derry Ellis. She said, while we're students at the collegiate school, we want you to know what we really call it. We call it a cool school. That really made me happy because it showed that they were enjoying their experiences there this year. I can't go to this. At the other end of the academic spectrum, we graduated our first class of doctoral students here at FSU Panama City. The nurse anesthesia program graduated 28 students, all who received a doctorate of nurse anesthesia practice degree. It, it gets better though, it gets better. You know, if I get an email from the president and the provost both in a day, I know something's wrong or something's really good. But when they had a 100% pass rate on their board exam to allow them to practice as an anesthetist, you know that was a great day. And congratulations to you, to all the faculty from the nurse anesthesia program. We finished our second year of financial planning at the undergraduate level, our third year of public health. We finished the year with, as I said, record enrollment, especially graduate enrollment, and received approval to offer our professional and public communication masters in an online format. Our systems engineering faculty received a grant to teach coding to secondary students and also led efforts to successfully become one of the few programs in the country to have their introductory systems engineering course designated as one that will automatically provide an industry certification. And I'm not an engineer, I don't understand what they say half the times, but I'll tell you that's important. That is really important. And the other thing this morning, Dr. Rasput, are you here? Dr. Rasput joined us last year or the year before? About two years ago. And this morning we received word that a graduate certificate in cybersecurity 
has been approved here. I want to thank you, Dr. Rasput, and thank you, Dr. Hodden, for your work on that. Our programs develop close connections with the community. More than 95% of our students graduated with a job or go directly into grad school. Industry, partner, industry partners marvel at the quality of our students. We're proud to be part of the INSPIRE program, which will clearly cause significant growth on our campus. You've all heard about the Ascent and Estuary programs. Thanks to all of you who are working in those programs. I could go on, but what we really do here is to make sure we're doing stuff for the students. We saw a lot more student activities, including intramural beach volleyball and kickball. We also have some new musicians here on campus and that um, I think I may need to ask for a royalty of their future earnings. And two years before the Tallahassee campus, two years before the Tallahassee campus, we started our intercollegiate esports team. We not only became a member of the Peach Belt Conference, conference but finished as runners up in the Champions Division in Overwatch. You bet. It was a great year, but this year will be even better. We're working on new degree programs. We hope they will include a new interdisciplinary medicine undergraduate degree and a new nursing degree in a few years. Both of these will be perfect fits with the new FSU health program. We're also working on building possibility of opening and building the new ECAP clinic in Tallahassee where our Tallahassee students in our nationally recognized ABA program can get their clinical hours. We're working to offer face-to-face -face classes in financial planning and hope that will be done in the near future in Tallahassee. Uh, our face-to-face -face classes here will start this semester. As I talk about where we've been and where we're going, I hope you can see the importance of being engaged through the community and the region from the K-12 level to working with industry on research matters. We've talked about this before. Our area, and when I think of our area, I think of everything between this campus and Dope Camel Stadium in Tallahassee. It's an area I grew up in, an area I'm proud to have called my home and still call my home. Let me tell you that that area that we serve, the students that we serve, they come from some of the poorest counties in the state with some of the lowest post-secondary attainment rates. We must work with our community to reverse those numbers. We talk a lot about the FSU PC Promise and the FSU PC Promise Scholarship where we try to help students in that way. One important part of the FSUPC promise is that FSUPC will always be your home. We are the university for this area and everyone should feel welcome when they visit. And I urge all of you to help us lead the way in that area as we move forward. Today we have two awards to give and these people clearly have made others feel at home here. The first award is the scholarship for Ms. Pat in honor of Ms. Pat Evans. Many of you knew Pat. We lost her about seven years ago. Pat was in faculty support and had a strong love for helping students. She was focused on serving everyone on campus with a kind spirit and with hard work. This year, I have the honor of presenting the Pat Evans Scholarship to a special student who is being recognized for his academic achievement, spirit of service, kindness, and hard work that makes our campus welcoming and inclusive. Let's hear about the first recipient.
please join me in welcoming the recipient of the Pat Evans Award, Tim Beaver. Now, as, as Tim's coming up, I want you to know we have this really nice certificate for you. But behind, soon, you will also, as you're checking your financial aid package, you'll see a scholarship in honor of Pat Evans' student. Well, I just want to give a quick thank you to all my professors that I have and uh, everyone I interact with. Uh, I am caught off guard, but thank you guys so much for welcoming me, me to the hearing. Early in my term, it was actually eight years ago, I read a letter from someone where this person said, you know, we may have a dean, but Alfred is our mayor. So that year, we established the Alfred L. Still Spirit of Service Award. This award is given to an employer or employees who have demonstrated demonstrated exceptional service and dedication to FSU Panama City. Join me in welcoming our friend and our mayor, Alfred Steele. Ladies and happy Thursday. <laughs> I want to, you know, just say a little bit about it, and everybody know I love them, and that um, it's just an honor that just to, just to be here among beautiful people, and just, you know, I love to see people smile, and I love to tell people that I love them. So when you're gone, can't get you. So let you know that I love you. And that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. And that, you know, everything will be good. Let's hear. <laughs> Let's hear a little bit about this year's winner of the Mayor's Award. Hi, I'm Alfred, the um, Mayor of FSU Panama City. And I'd like to um, say some personal my speech to receive the mayor award they are very deserving and very caring and shows the character of, of, of me selecting for this award and I was very happy and very delighted with it this person is very good at solving for our problems and does it with a very impressive smile hi I'm Elizabeth Smith with the Bay County Chamber of Commerce I'm truly honored to be asked to speak on behalf of the majority and I'm so pleased to have been recognized for all of their um, accomplishments at FSU. I've had the pleasure of working with them for many years um, through the chamber, and they are always willing to go the extra mile and accommodate and help and assist, even when we come up with some of the craziest ideas. Thank you for all you do for us, and thank you for always making us look so good. This award is super funny. This year, the, 
the FSUPC Mayor Alfred L. Still Service Award goes to Stephanie Smith. I just that, that way you don't have to be hitting my phone. <laughs> I just want to say I'm not worthy. No. <laughs> this is the man, right here. Yeah. Dr. Clark gave it away when he said, just speak up on me. I can always hear his shoes come down the hall. But I want to thank you. Thank you. Now, congratulations to both of you. Stephanie, thank you for all you do here at FSUPC. Now for our final guest of the afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I don't blame you. It's after lunch. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. How we doing? There we go. That's much better. That is much better. Uh, I am truly humbled um, and honored to be right here at this podium at this very moment uh, to be speaking to such great women. Right? Um, I brought with me somebody from this, uh, this FSU. Miss Albert Alligator, I'm a U.S. grad, so I brought it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Mrs. Abam. Mr. Nikwe. Dr. Bilan. Mr. Tutuani. Mrs. Ferreira. Mrs. Duchesne. These are names of people that have influenced me via education. Some as early as a third grade. Ann Ferreira was my third grade teacher. This is the impact that each and every one of you bear the responsibility of sitting here in this room. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed faculty and distinguished guests, I'm truly honored to stand before you today at the annual Fall Welcome Back Luncheon and Symposium. Heartfelt thanks go to Florida State University in Panama City for orchestrating this event and for your unwavering dedication to fostering and nurturing a vibrant educational environment. As Commanding Officer of Naval Support Activity Panama City, I'm deeply aware of the profound impact our collective efforts have on shaping the future. Today, I want to highlight how our partnership with FSU Panama City is pivotal in growing our local community 
and cultivating the leaders of tomorrow. At NSA Panama City, our mission is to engage, enable, and sustain the warfighter. We strive to build an unparalleled installation by providing top-notch facilities, ensuring the security of critical infrastructure, and offering comprehensive support to the fleet, fighter, and family. With key tenants like the Naval Surface Warfare Center, Panama City Division, the Naval Diving and Salvage Training Center, the Navy Expeditionary Diving Unit, and the U.S. Coast Guard Station, Panama City, we employ over 4,000 personnel and contribute more than half a billion dollars significantly impacting our community. However, our true success is not solely measured by numbers. It lies in the depth of our impact on our community. Each of you is a crucial part of this mission. Your drive to inspire curiosity, exploration, and forward thinking exemplifies a profound commitment to shaping students into future leaders. Your focus on holistic development and inclusivity and well-being is indispensable in nurturing the next generation of innovators and problem solvers. Today, I want to focus on five essential principles that can elevate our leadership and enrich our community. Influence, service, authenticity, relationships, and responsibility. These principles are not just abstract concepts, they are the bedrock of effective leadership and impactful education. I don't stand here as a professor with a PhD, nor do I stand here with any premise of being the most intelligent individual out here. But the topic I'm talking about with reference to leadership is one that I've been exercising for the past 32 years. And in my eyes, our roles as leaders is synonymous. And it was, it's with that background that I speak humbly to this crowd over here to energize and reinvigorate you all as you begin this new academic year. Influence. Leadership is about more than just authority. It's about making a difference. True influence comes from inspiring others through our actions and values. Strive to be a beacon of excellence and dedication. Your influence shapes the world around you and sets a standard for others to follow. Ann Pereira, who kept me in class during lunch break to study my three times tables, had absolutely no idea that her contribution to me would land me in a position like this. Think about your role in the individuals you're about to influence. Service. At the core of leadership is service. It's about genuinely understanding and meeting the needs of those we guide. My skill to inspire greatness from those I lead by serving them is what I call leadership. And that's how I define leadership. You think about that one individual in your life that you would go through a brick wall for in a heartbeat. Nine times out of 10, it's probably not gonna be somebody that you consider a role model in the educational realm or you pick your choice. It's more than likely gonna be your mother, your father, or that one individual or people that served you the most that were there for no personal gain. They were there just to be there for you, to serve you. I would go to the world's end on my mom's behalf. Even though she spanked me, even though she punished me, she was there for me for everything. That is what I call the true attribute of servitude. 
and as influencers for that next generation, the generation that we are charged and empowered for training, it is critical that we realize that we should be treating them as such, being of great service to them through services. Authenticity. Authenticity means leading with integrity and consistency. It's about being true to yourself and your values, which builds deep trust and respect. When you lead authentically, you foster genuine connection and inspire others to do the same. We all have traits that are learned traits. We all pick up things along the way. We all pick up styles as we move along. But what makes us truly effective is by ingesting, understanding what it is that we pick up and making it our own to be able to authentically lead, teach, impart knowledge. Relationships. Building meaningful relationships is vital. We've got to connect with others on a personal level, find common ground, and foster a sense of community. We've got to celebrate achievements and reward progress. These efforts create a supportive environment where everyone feels valued and motivated. I know we have l large classes, <coughs> and so it's impossible to say within a term or a semester we're going to get to know everyone. But we have tools at our hand to pick up the nuances that are the so-called cheat codes for the people that we're charged with influencing. Consider it speed dating, right? You get in front of somebody and all you're doing is trying to figure out how you can get to their heart as quick as possible. As you take your podium this next semester, make it a point to speed date each of your students. Try to figure out how it is that you can connect and have a meaningful connection in such a way that they're ready to glean whatever information it is that you're willing and going to impart to them. Communication, it's the bedrock of everything, right? The burden of understanding lies with the leader. So as professors, if you have students in your classroom and they're not getting it, provide to you this tool to get to know your people, get to find what their cheat code is, understand the barriers that exist between yourselves and them, and maybe in the environment, and make it your charge to press on through to give them the ability to understand. Responsibility. Leadership comes with a profound responsibility. It's about being accountable for our actions, their impact on others as well. Embrace the responsibility of setting an example, taking ownership, and striving for excellence. Balance your personal and professional lives to ensure that you fully represent and present a supportive persona. Your commitment to this balance enhances your ability to guide and uplift those around you. When I talk about balance, I'm talking about personal balance here. As a sailor, as a commander with sailors that work with me on the installation, I know from personal experience, I went into work every single day with the intent of doing the best I could professionally. Now, if the dog ate my homework or um, I had road rage and route to work or something happened before I got to work, those were the distractors, those were the detractors from my ability to do my work to the best extent possible. As educators, I implore you to exercise balance, and that way you can be the best version of yourself the minute you take the podium.
As educators and leaders, remember that your mission and vision are the guiding lights that drive your efforts. Stay dedicated to those goals and lead them to inspire and motivate you each day. The difference you make in your students' lives will be transformative and enduring. For whatever subject it is that you are teaching, it has got to be the most important thing ever. Each of your students should believe that what you're imparting is exactly what they need to survive each day. Your passion will go a long way. It will inspire them to truly hang on to every word coming from your mouth. As we embark on this new academic year, let us commit ourselves to these principles by leading with influence, serving with dedication, embracing authenticity, building strong relationships, and accepting our responsibilities. We have to create an environment where everyone thrives. Together we can lay the groundwork for a brighter, more promising future. All the accounts I've heard while sitting here this afternoon tell me that we're doing that right here at this school. My job here is not to teach you anything that you don't already know. But I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to let you know that you matter. matter beyond belief. The next generation depends on what we teach them. That is a great responsibility. Stay encouraged. Know that we all stand by you in making sure that that next generation can do the best job it can. Thank you for your unwavering dedication and commitment. Let's continue to grow and inspire and lead with a purpose, making a lasting impact on each and every life we touch. Thank you. Let's give another big round of applause to Commander Mosey. I love this guy, and I cannot thank him enough for his unwavering support of Florida State University, Panama City. He is only a phone call away, and so many of our students interned there. And now as we prepare to close, I want to say, I know it's, it's, it's been rather long, but I want to thank Thank, again, thank say thank you again to uh, Dr. Wilfred Maris for that very interesting story on on bees. And I was telling Commander Mosey, he said, "I don't know the difference between all those honeys." I said, "You got to try the Tupelo honey. That stuff does not crystallize after a, a few months. It can stay there for years, and it's not cheap." I also want to say uh, thank you to Miss Gina Littleton. Uh, she had to leave, and remind you that you will receive an email. Uh, each one of you will. Uh, hopefully you will uh, contribute to the campaign. It's a, it is a one-week campaign, So, and our goal is 12000 and we met our goal of 11000 last year. Also, uh, Susanna, thank you again. Uh, I didn't get my new name tag. Summer went past the dean's office, so maybe we'll get it soon. Or maybe we haven't even ordered them. I don't know. Uh, Dr. Frank? I would be in touch with you. I, I don't have to go through JT anymore. We brought Larry Yazzie here last year, and I didn't know who the person was, so I went through the uh, provost's office. There's been a lot of interest in bringing Native American events uh, here to FSU Panama City, so we, we would definitely have you as a, a resource. And to my musician friends, wow. Job well done. They have one more song as a part of our closing out. And to our student body president, uh, President Creed, uh, so great to serve with you. Uh, SDC is such a great resource, and I know it's in great.
great hands. And again, Commander Mosey, I want to say thank you very much. And as I prepare to close, I want to welcome all new back in staff to the FSU Panama City family and to my colleagues I have worked with over the last seven years. Uh, it has only been through your selfless efforts and dedication to teaching and learning that has truly transformed FSU Panama City into a destination university. So I'm very excited about this new academic year and the difference that we can make in the lives of our students to support the quality of their educational experience and their ultimate success. Like Commander Mosi said, what you do will forever touch the lives of the students that we serve. So I am very eager, eager for all of us to fulfill every component of the PC promise. And that promise is to partner with our students to ensure that they are well prepared to help them find their pathways. And like our Dean said, to instill in them that FSU Panama City will always be their home. Go knows one more musical selection and then we're gonna chop our way out of here. Let's go. Remember to have fun, cause we are. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. Sunshine, she's here, you can take a break. I'm a hot air balloon that could go to space. With the air, like I don't care, baby, by the way. Hey, because I'm happy. I belong if you feel like a room without a room. Cause I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Because hey, I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like that's what you wanna do. It hey, comes bad back. news, talking this and that. Give me all you got and don't hold back. I should probably warn you, I'll be just fine. No offense to you, don't waste your time. Here's why. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. Can't nothing bring me down. Can't nothing bring me down. My love was too high. Bring me down. Can't nothing bring me down. I say, bring me down. Can't nothing bring me down. My level's too high. Bring me down. Can't nothing bring me down. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like happiness. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. Bring me down. Can't nothing. Bring me down. My love's too high. 